You have created a monster and it will destroy you. This is getting out of hand. Now there are two of them. Yo quiero Taco Bell. I don't know what the heck's going on here, but someone needs to get their asses kicked. I'll be back. What's your favorite scary movie? This one looked at me. Take your stinking hands off me, you damn dirty human! You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? I am talking about the real possibility that he is still out there. <laughs> You're listening to Unhinged with Kyriakos Vilches. In this universe, there's only one absolute. Everything freezes. I freeze. I'm Batman. Poison. Poison Ivy. Her name is Pamela Isley. I saw her talking to Gordon. She must have stolen his keys and changed the signal. Yeah, she did it for me, for love. She's infected us with some sort of pheromone extract. Oh, is that what it is, Bruce? I'm under some kind of magic spell? She wants to kill you, dick. You would say anything to keep her away from me, wouldn't you? To keep her for yourself. You once said to me that being part of a team means trusting your partner and sometimes counting on someone else is the only way to win. You remember that? You weren't talking about being partners, you were talking about being a family. So I'm asking you, friend, partner, brother, will you trust me now? Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Unhinged with Kyriakos Vilches. On this episode of Unhinged, I'll be doing a commentary track for 1997's Batman and Robin. I'm going at this one solo. I don't have my co-host here with me. We do have that Alexander review in the pipeline that should be coming out sometime in late October, early November, God willing. Um, but today a little something different for you guys. I'm going to do a commentary for, uh, <laughs> embarrassingly, one of my favorite Batman movies. Uh, I'm going to base that off of nostalgia and me watching this as a six-year-old back in 1997. Yes, it is Batman and Robin, the much maligned and much hated Joel Schumacher vehicle, which kind of ended the Batman franchise abruptly. Oh, and there goes my computer acting up. So yes, yeah, so what we're going to do, if you want to watch along with me, I'm at the title menu. Uh, you know what? Hold on. Let me just kind of reset that for you guys. I'm watching the two-disc special edition DVD, so uh, once you kind of pop that into your player, um, or if you're streaming it, um, we're going to start in three, two, one. All right. So, um, yeah, Batman and Robin. Um, I love to, you know, off the bat, you know, let me know what you guys think of this movie. Um, leave that in the Leave send me a message. Uh, leave a comment here on on the uh, the podcast episode. Uh, I don't say message board. The the uh, just just let me know what you think of the the movie. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, obviously make a comment. Leave a comment for me. But yeah, um, Schumacher was tasked with bringing Batman and Robin into a new era of relevancy in the superhero genre, especially after the success of Batman Forever. By the way, I love this title sequence. Um, ironically enough, I feel like The Dark Knight Rises borrowed that icy Warner Brothers uh, aesthetic to the logo later on. So Christopher Nolan, <laughs> a little, little inspiration there from Joel Schumacher. Uh, yeah, Batman and Robin. And of course we have the infamous suit up scene where we get <laughs> the close up of the bat butt bat nipple bat crotch um you know obviously a lot of people hated this when it came out um this was kind of a setup for how the rest of the movie was going to be the uh yeah i what i did like about this one is that they they went all camp right so whereas 
Batman Forever was kind of a mixed tone between keeping in line with what Tim Burton did with Batman and Batman Returns. This one went, okay, we, we, in, we, inter- we introduced the audience to some goofiness regarding how we're going to take Batman in this new direction. So let's kind of amp that up to like 150%. <laughs> and uh, many people did not like that. Um, as I got older, I realized that Schumacher kind of really dipped into like the silver age of comics regarding Batman's earlier stories. Chicks dig the car, right? Yeah. You know, and a lot of people said they, uh, we'll, we'll touch on this in a second, but yeah, Schumacher kind of dipped into the Silver Age of Comics lore regarding Batman and kind of got a lot of inspiration from the uh, Adam West TV series in the 60s. See, this is, so this part right here where Batman's taking off <laughs> and Alfred says that they're going to cancel the pizza. Wait, uh, it's coming up here. Robin's watching the... Uh, what 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 did Robin even call this motorcycle? It was like the the bird bike or, or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, that's right. Alfred uh, cancels the pizza now. Right here, um, <laughs> when I was a kid and I first saw this, I thought <laughs> I thought Alfred was crying because <laughs> he had to cancel the pizza. So yeah, but you know, obviously he's dying from McGregor syndrome. We don't know that yet. You know what I don't get is in this one, Commissioner Gordon doesn't really have anything to do. He's just kind of he's just kind of there. Whereas like in the first one, he kind of had a presence and then the second one, he kind of did some stuff. Like the third and fourth one, he's just like a goofy supporting background character. It's like he he does nothing. He really does nothing in this one. So Pat Hingle, they just threw him in you know he's he's like michael goff it's like hey he's part of the franchise he's going to be here regardless whether or not he has anything to do so yeah now we have to we have we have to appreciate the suit that arnold schwarzenegger is wearing here i mean practically speaking this was this is this is really cool in terms of the costume design I mean, it, it kind of, it reminds me of, like, the animated series version, but then it also reminds me of, like, a spruced up, flashy, like, I, I wouldn't even call it retro, like, kind of a sci-fi-ish uh, aesthetic to it. Um, as for Arnold's acting in the movie, it's kind of, <laughs> I, I don't even know if there's a specific, uh, if you could even, s- the summation of his acting in this movie depends on who you're talking to. Some people just, they'll say that he absolutely sucks in this movie. I think (laughs) Arnold is probably one of the highlights in the movie because he just, he's just so much fun to fucking watch in this movie. He's just all the ice puns. Uh, Obviously here, uh, George Clooney (laughs) is on a roller. uh, He's skating down the dinosaur. What I, what you don't, what makes this scene, you know, honestly, regrettably uh, maligned uh, for many people is that the obvious wire work and the acrobatics that are going on here, it just, Batman and Robin look like they're floating around in the room. Like there's no, there's no sense of centering the characters uh, in reality. Like they're, they're doing these goofy things, but then even the goofiness looks artificial. And that's why one of the main complaints against this movie was that it was more like a promotion for a toy commercial. Like, it was a toy commercial. Pretty much this movie was made to sell toys. Um, And Joel Schumacher was even uh, reportedly told people on set when they were filming things, like, hey, guys, remember, this is, uh, we're filming uh, something like, these are comic book characters, so keep that in mind. Don't take this too seriously. And... You know, some people took that to heart, like Schwarzenegger. Um, There are moments throughout the film where it gets serious, and it looks like people are seriously acting. (laughs) 
Other times they're just winging it. I will say for a kid watching this, this is probably one of the fucking coolest things you could see as a kid. Like the wild, zany maneuvers that Batman and Robin are doing. The childlike humor of the whole thing. So that's why I'm saying that if Schumacher intended this to be a modernized, well, I wouldn't say modernized, but a 90s era version of the 1960s Adam West TV show, then he'd, he'd like hit the mark. If this had come out as like a comedy, I think it'd be better well received. But if it's following in line with like what we saw, we got Batman in 1989. He's like, you, you can't believe that this is the same Batman. It's like George Clooney's version versus Michael Keaton's. It's like, it's like night and day. But yeah, it is what it is. Um, so this scene here where they're hitting around the ice, the, I'm sorry, the diamond. Um, yeah, a lot of that, what I don't, what I don't under understand is how Batman and Robin figured out that they needed skates in their boots for this exact moment. But hey, and again, we get another one of Mister Freeze's uh, ice puns. What killed the dinosaurs? The Ice Age. Of course, the dinosaur falls over. It makes a sound for some <laughs> for some reason. So, when I first saw that as a kid, I was like, uh, "Was it a lie?" You know, it's just. And I noticed like movies from the, I'd say mid to late nineties, whether like not even the superhero genre, like they'd add like weird gimmicky like cheesy noise effects for things that either weren't alive or weren't sentient, or weren't necessary to be honest with you like honking and horn blowing and just cartoonish sounds in movies that were obviously geared towards children but they made them even goofier than they're supposed to be and of course this one's supposed to appear to uh, a much younger audience i would presume even though it is i mean batman is for for everybody you know regardless of age but i you know obviously schumacher is going for more of that family friendly entertainment in this but then he doesn't, and we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that in a moment. Because people do die in this, and people do get killed. Like the people that Mr. Freeze has been beating up and, like, freezing to death. Batman and Robin aren't getting to them in time. Like, they're obviously dying of hypothermia, and Batman and Robin are completely okay with that. So this right here, when we see this scene, and I obviously, at this point, I knew, you know, yeah, the very uh, interesting <laughs> design <laughs> for that rocket. Um, I, w I will say that the miniature work in this movie is pretty cool. You see how the rocket kind of bursts through the ceiling window of the museum. Pretty nice. And they, they do that throughout this. We, we, are, we do feel like we are there. The CGI, however, we instantly forget about that. But this is to me, this was very James... Uh, this was very James Bond-esque, this moment here. You know, Mr. Freeze is taking them up into space. He's 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 obviously caught Batman at a disadvantage. I mean, there's the infamous, oh, your doom is coming in, insert time frame here. So, yeah, he's about to escape here. Robin's clinging to the outside of the rocket, being totally useless at the moment. I almost feel like I'm robbing Sandeep of uh, an opportunity here to come in and all the craziest thing. Maybe next time I'll have him do uh, another Batman film. Maybe we might revisit this one. Um, yeah, but this one is a... Uh, this one's something else. What what I don't understand is that these little laser pointer things that they both have. Um, and you know what? You on one hand you could say <laughs> it's 
fucking ridiculous, obviously, that Batman and Robin have uh, somehow figured out that they need a gadget for every one of Mr. Freeze's gimmicky, villainous devices that he uses against them. But on the other hand, I mean, Batman in the comics is the world's greatest detective, and he is pulling things out of his ass to figure things out half the time. And the bat gadgets are a thing. I mean, the dude literally has, and this right here, just for a moment, horrible CGI, you can tell. And in a few moments, we're going to get one of the most 90s era moments in this film. They're riding through the sky on these, I mean, they're literally skateboarding, snowboarding and towards Mr. Freeze. It's ridiculous. Mr. Freeze has these elaborate wings coming out of his, he's like, he looks like the Falcon. Robin catches the diamond, and here here we go in a few seconds. And this is what... Yeah, that fucking cowabunga. And again, that's simply... And even now, that's it's dated because late 90s, the first person that comes to mind... But we're talking about late 90s Bart Simpson when it comes to cowabunga. Yeah. So again, Schumacher trying to insert a lot of the pop culture that was going on at this time into the film making it appealing for kids you know because who was more popular with kids around this time maybe as popular as batman with children probably bart simpson i remember seeing something about them wearing like like schools banning like my name's bart simpson who the hell are you shirts you know Funny enough, you can still find some of these shirts. They're on eBay for like $70, $80. Um, some people charging even more, for like $200, $250 for some of these retro Bart Simpson shirts. If you're in the market for that kind of stuff. Um, as much as I like collecting certain things from that era, $200 for a shirt isn't my cup of tea. So right here, we get the, the hero's choice moment, Mr. Freeze. <laughs> freezes Robin. You know, on cue, his ice vehicle comes charging, blasting through the wall. He leaves with some well-placed puns. And, you know, it's going to be really exhausting trying to say each pun, because I, I, I kid you not, Schwarzenegger delivers pun after pun after pun after pun. And while... I, I admittedly, while many of them are, fun, they they are so bad that they're good. It does get exhausting, and I can see why a lot of people had a problem with the way he was playing Mister Freeze. Because you know, traditionally speaking, Mister Freeze is a very tragic character. If you're if you're go go going by the most honest and beloved interpretation of him, and he wasn't meant to be this goofy comedic sideshow villain. But hey, you know that's what they're going for. Again, there's that lay supporter. What I was thinking was that when Batman is heating up the pool, I mean, he's boiling the water enough to thaw Robin out. So shouldn't Robin be coming out like scald scalding? You know, obviously no steam or heat coming off of him. Yeah, and that's our introduction to Mr. Freeze. Uh, up at this point, if you're watching this in the theaters, I, I never saw it in theaters. Uh... For the parents taking their kids, they they probably knew what they were they were in for, so they were strapped in. The kids were probably, I'm thinking the kids probably were eating it up. Um, I mean, I know I was a kid during that time when I saw it shortly after it released um, on home video. I think it was I think the first time I did see it was on VHS. Um, yeah, I, I ate it up. I was like, this is the coolest shit ever. Um, looking back on it, I appreciate it now seeing it through a different lens that it's so bad it's good and it's honestly and I'm going to say it right now I think this one is much more enjoyable than Batman Forever I can admit Batman Forever has a more cohesive story this one is more entertaining to watch though and I think it's because Schum Schumacher kind of proved himself to the studios and saying hey I can deliver a film that is enjoyable uh, let me do what I can with it to bring it to the stratosphere of wherever I think it should go. And he really just put the pedal to the metal when it came to camp. Um, whereas Batman Forever was like a mixed tone of like keeping in line with what Burden did with Batman and Batman Returns and also trying to keep uh, like 
dip his toes into what he wanted to explore the aesthetic the type of acting the story what have you and here we get and this i believe is john glover playing uh there's this is actually a an actual character in the batman mythos i forget what his name is but um he does you know i honestly wish he was in the movie more who i don't wish was in the movie more and is obviously there just because batman nightfall was popular at the time is bane and as you can see here, Bane is being injected with Venom. A little different from his comic origin. Um, and he's pretty... Essentially, he's just the muscle in this movie for Poison Ivy. He's not really... We're not, we're not, you're think, when you say Bane now, you think of Christopher Nolan's Bane from The Dark Knight Rises. This is the most recent cinematic interpretation. And even then, you there were some liberties taken with that version. This is like very cartoonish very two-dimensional in terms of who this character is and of course this guy was played by a pro wrestler uh jeep something I forget his last name uh and he sh unfortunately passed a few months after this movie released uh so last film role um what i will give the production design, I won't say production, more. I think it would be a uh, makeup department credit for here, is that Bane's skin, um, that isn't uh, from what you would think is some, some, he's not wearing anything from what I read. That's actually paint or makeup that they applied to his body to make him look like he was uh, like his vascularity was much more pronounced and grotesque. So that's actually makeup there. So they did a good job there. Um, as far as like his acting, I mean, you're not going to get much from this Bane. He's just grunting and groaning and Bane, Bane, Bane. I mean, he says a few things throughout, but that's really it. Yeah, don't do that enough. Hurts your throat, by the way. There's another scene where they cut back to him, and he does that exactly, and you'll see that. Um, then there's Uma Thurman as the lovely Dr. Pamela Isley. And even at, even dressed down, Uma Thurman's a beautiful woman. I don't know why. Um, people said that she was horrible as Poison Ivy. Um, as I mean, she looks great. I mean, I, I feel like aside from Schwarzenegger, she, she knew what she signed up for with Poison Ivy. I think she's also one of the highlights of the movie. Even if the story revolving around her is kind of garbage. and But it's good garbage. It's it, it's enjoyable garbage. It's garbage that you want to play in like you're a raccoon on a field trip. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So, But Donald Glover here as her boss, I wish I, I really wish that he had a lot more to do here or he, he was or his role was expanded beyond what it is like I'd watch a Batman movie with this villain and then obviously he pushes her to her death into her chemical into the chemicals here and and this is very burden-esque right here and Batman returns when Christopher Walken's character um my god I'm forgetting that character's name too what was his name Max uh Shrek there you go when Max Shrek put, pushes her out the window and she dies and she falls like, what, 30, 40 stories, maybe more. Um, she gets brought back to life by cats here. Poison Ivy is going to be brought back to life by the literal earth that she falls into. You know, Glover is hamming it up. Poison Ivy is getting sucked into the soil. And uh, we'll soon have our Poison Ivy. Um, so this scene here where they're looking at the CCT footage <laughs> of Mr. Freeze and his wife, um, obviously filmed as a, uh, as an add-on Arnold, ah! falls into the vat, uh, You know, and I, I can appreciate they gave us some kind of origin as to why he's Mr. Freeze. They did the same thing 
with Tommy Lee Jones and his two-faced character, Batman Forever. Um, you know, had they gone with a more serious Mr. Freeze, I, I think the origin story would have been much more meaningful. I mean, here it's kind of like a throwaway, oh, let's look at this TCT footage and see exactly how the goofy pun villain, and there's not a villain we're dealing with, was before he became the goofy pun villain. Alfred's over there leaning on the suit. They're so, uh, And there's this, see, there was this criticism levied at George Clooney in this film that he, he did this thing in his ER days where he bobbled his head quite a bit when he spoke, um, whether he was doing it as a form of extra inflection or to kind of compound his, his words. Like right here when he's walking through the hallway with Alfred, he was kind of putting his head down and he's like, looks like a little bobblehead. <laughs> um, he said con consciously, he didn't know he was doing that. Like he, he had to actually kind of retrain himself not to do that. Although there's, there are moments now that when he's acting, he still kind of, he still does it. Like there are moments when it's very pronounced and it's a tick that he has, but honestly, if you're not really trying to pay attention to it, it's, it's like you get over it really fast. I mean, it's kind of like um, I can't think of another actor that has a very pronounced like facial tick or movement that he does when he acts. Oh, you know what Nicolas Cage does? I mean, he does this thing where he looks like he's nodding in agreement with whatever he's saying. He's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, right, 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 right. And he's kind of nodding his head constantly. And this right here is a very, well, anyway, that's enough about <laughs> Nicolas Cage. So that scene where he's in, so what I liked about this movie is that across all, I guess, each Batman movie in this fr in this franchise, the Burton and Schumacher films, they, they did have, they showed Bruce, Wayne, and Alfred's relationship as related to his work as Batman. This was really the only one that focused on their relationship as two individuals, as kind of a father-son dynamic, where Alfred's mortality and Bruce coming to terms with that is explored. And the moments where George Clooney and Michael Goff are acting on screen together as Bruce Wayne and Alfred are actually really nice. And you could see where the script worked and where maybe something much better written could have worked even more. But I really did like that. And uh, now this look right here, I wish Poison Ivy had retained this look throughout the rest of the movie because Schumacher goes like, again, above and beyond. He, ran, he amps it up to 150% with costume design and he does it with her and I wish she did it she has these cone like cone conical things on her head and I don't know wasn't a fan poison yeah this was a good introduction right and you're not going to see this type of setup in superhero movies now or if you look around at the environment that she's in this is a set this isn't cgi this isn't some cheap studio lot i mean for this film's credit you know schumacher uh unbeknownst to people who kind of lampooned him at the time and really went after him for his directorial decisions he was a pretty well-established production designer, set designer. And there's that same same exact scene of Bane growling. They just, anyway. anyway um, you're not going to see an environment like this in a movie where it looks like you are in a super, in a comic book, right? Right now, you watch any Marvel film, it's all 
CGI backdrops, green screen. You can tell they're not really there. Here, you, you feel like you're there, so that's nice. And again, that's that late 90s production aesthetic that we were, me and my, you know, people who remember were lucky enough to grow up with. So, so this right here, I didn't like. Again, the ice puns you can you can get with because obviously Schwarzenegger is being campy. This right here, he's singing to like, you know. I think that was um. What was that like? Nineteen sixties, fifties, fifty sixties claymation, a Santa Claus story. I forget. I, Mister What? Yeah, whatever. I forget it. <laughs> and then we have. Isn't that Vivica? Vivica A. Fox? As a stand in for who Debbie Mazar and uh, Drew Barrymore were in Batman Forever. Kind of a throw, again, a throwaway character. Didn't need to be there at all. I don't know if she was doing a favor for Schumacher, if she was on set. She liked Batman and she wanted to be in the movie. She asked a favor. I mean, I don't know. One thing that they do well in this movie is that they explain why he needs these diamonds. One, they provide energy for his suit. Two, it's part of his grander scheme to freeze the city. Cure for Nora. You know the one of the best incarnation, I'll say incarnations, uh, versions of Mister Freeze's story with his wife. Uh, there's a very poignant storyline or subplot in Batman uh, Arkham City, uh, the video game, and Mister Freeze is actually one of the highlight villains of that video game. Probably the best boss battle. Be the best one. Yeah. Maybe aside from Ra's al Ghul. But yeah, they approached it like seriously. Mr. Freeze was supposed to be a tragic character. And, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger can't act. I've seen him in... He's done very serious and uh, dramatic roles in his career. Um, but this was like late 90s, like post... Uh, I think this is the kindergarten cop era, maybe a little bit after, but this was when Arnold had already established himself as an action star. He's done the really gritty, dark, like sci-fi thrillers. Um, and this is his comedy phase. Like this is a, this is family fun Arnold. Um, this isn't quite declining career Arnold or post 2003 Arnold when he reached like the peak of him being relevant in cinema like with Terminator 3 and films like collateral damage um so he's not quite there yet but this is kind of like this is family fun goofy arnold that's just hey the paycheck's big enough arnold will do it and and hey i i i like arnold in this he's he's not he's not bad he's he's good at the camp it's just this wasn't the right mr freeze for a first time cinematic introduction but yeah what I don't understand is that that's Alfred's niece. So Peg is Alfred's sister. So when did she have Barbara? And for those of you who aren't as well, uh, well, aren't as knowledgeable about Barbara Gordon's origin, she's actually supposed to be Barbara. Well, uh, Barbara. She's Barbara. What the hell's her name? Is she Pennyworth or something else? She's supposed to be Barbara Gordon. Barbara Gordon is the daughter of. Commissioner Gordon, she becomes Batgirl and then gets paralyzed by the Joker and then becomes Oracle, kind of like a tech-savvy uh, Bat-team support character in the comics. But here she's Alfred's niece, and she's going to school in Oxford, and her mom is a Brit. Family's very British, but she has an American accent, so I don't know who she raised here in America and then moved to England. Did her dad raise her and then she went with her mom? It's very confusing, and the more you think about it, it doesn't hold up. And this problem c 
continues the same problem Batman Forever had, where you don't know what the how how old each fucking character is between Robin and Batgirl. Um, even Alfred, he's supposed to be in his sixties, but then if he has a sister that had a kid that's in her what I seem I assume to be the early twenties, like what when the fuck did she have? There, I mean, not, not that there's anything wrong with that. She maybe she had her child later on, but the thing you look at Robin and he was supposed to be like a teenager in Batman Forever, but he's clearly like in his early to mid twenties, probably mid twenties at this time. I forget how old Chris O'Donnell was, but this this Schumacher's versions always had a weird grasp of age and applying age to the story. And then here's Alfred's buddy Wilfred, and again, he, like black and white photos. He's in India or something. And see, and there's a photo of Peg, his sister, and this looks like it was taken in like the 30s or the 30s or the 40s. So, how old did she have Barbara? I mean, was she pregnant in the nursing home? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. You know what I will say is um, Michael Goff always goes to bat with this role. I mean, I, I always liked him as Alfred. I liked him in 89's Batman, Returns, Forever. He's he's always just, he's, he's good. He's such a great actor. I mean, he could be in a horrible movie, and he's just good. Um, but even the great Michael Goff couldn't save Batman Forever from its critics. Uh, and we have Batgirl, well, pre-Batgirl, Barbara sneaking out. Now, I'm watching the DVD version of this. Um, unless I really want something for like a special edition release or a 4K release, I'm not going to go out of my way because I, I have to have a hard copy of every film. This is something I've always just been about. Like, I love having, because obviously VHS has gone out the window a long time ago, but DVDs were kind of my era with growing up as a kid that, you know, DVDs were the big thing. But for me, I just I just like having DVDs, and more often than not, they're always loaded with, like, two discs, special features, or, <coughs> excuse me, like, limited release editions, steel books, where they have extra uh, bonus, where they have bonus content or commentary tracks, all this extra stuff, and uh, I have the two-disc special edition for this one, but there is like a 4K or a Blu-ray Blu out there, so if you're watching that version, um, just let me know, Is this, does the film look better than what it appears to be in the DVD version, or does it actually highlight the, the CGI worse? Um, some movies actually do that, like it's like the opposite effect, the more detailed the uh, the copy is when it comes to Blu-ray or 4K. It actually shows more of just how badly the CGI is aged. Again, this lady right here, uh, Gertie something, she's actually, this is actually Bob Kane's wife. Um, and, uh, She's in this one, and she's in Batman Forever. And I think it was starting with Nolan's trilogy that Bill Finger started getting more credit for Batman. And uh, he wasn't excluded from the conversation when it comes to who conceptualized Batman, who really brought Batman to prominence among uh, comic book lovers and people who started developing a passion for the f franchise as a whole because um, yeah Bill Finger got the uh, cold shoulder when it came to that there, act there, there was actually a very nice documentary about him not too long ago and they kind of highlighted his contributions and he contributed quite a bit to Batman the Joker so many characters within Batman's world so And here, there's a, what can I do for you? Little bobblehead. Little bobblehead. 
Yeah, you know, but again, at the same time, George Clooney isn't a bad Bruce Wayne. I think most of the criticism was him as Batman because you can't differentiate between his Bruce Wayne and his Batman. I mean, his Batman was fine for this movie. I mean, it wasn't, it was, he's kind of just there as Batman. Like, the plot kind of moves Batman forward. Batman doesn't move the plot. If that makes any sense, but it's not like a Christian Bale Batman where you can really appreciate the, how different that Batman is from Bruce Wayne. Here it's just like, okay, yeah, Bruce Wayne is Batman. Batman is Bruce Wayne based off of their mannerisms, the way they speak. At least he doesn't growl. That's one thing I didn't, I couldn't stand about Christian Bale as the movies progress. Like he'd growl more and more and he'd just gruff and, where are they? Tell me where the trigger is. Sounds like he has a bad case of laryngitis. But here I can appreciate that Clooney was his, he was playing a, a, an okay, he was playing a pretty good Bruce Wayne. I mean, you can't complain about it. Gossip Gertie. Gossip Gertie, that's what her name is. Damn it, now I remember it. Okay. And again, when I talk about the camp aspect that Schumacher embraced in this movie, you see this Save the Rainforest costume ball, Batman and Robin are special guests. Okay, the 60s Adam West TV show was well known for doing stuff like this. Like Batman and Robin would be at like ribbon cutting ceremonies and they would be getting the key to the city in Gotham and they would be part of like benefit fundraisers and they would be doing all kinds of like extracurricular activities at a like local celebrity would do because they were just local celebrities like and batman would be i mean there were moments where he was like at a dance off and stuff it's all, all kinds of zany goofy stuff but again that is not alien to what batman was all about from like the mid to late 50s to early 70s so you're talking about like 15 plus years of like goofy story arcs because of the comics code authority and Schumacher pulled directly from that for his Batman film, which is pr prob what I think is an, om an homage to that. And the people that write this one off as a, some shitty installment that completely disregarded Batman was, well, actually, no, you're wrong, and I'm more than willing to debate you on that because the version that we all, that we mostly love and we mostly find connection with is that darker, modern version, starting with, like, uh, like the mid to late 80s, like dark, the dark night, literally dark. He's brooding and, and shadowy and he's grittier. That's the version that we all think of when we think of Batman. Um, but that's not actually the version that has been around the longest. I mean, the Golden Age Batman actually killed people. The Silver Age was goofier and, and did all kinds of campy, silly things. The, it's the modern age that we really appreciated more, I think, for who Batman could really be as a character. But, yeah. The cityscape, I will say. Schumacher, again, keeping in line with what he did with in Batman Forever. Gothic architecture, keeping some of that noirish aesthetic to Gotham. But also, very... I, I wouldn't say Blade Runner, not really Blade Runner. It's more just very colorful, very vibrant, very uh, big, loud. Just, again, his, his set designer background is like make everything flashier, louder, more pronounced. And you see that. Again, this jungle-themed party here. Um, very big, very loud, very colorful. And uh, there's Commissioner Gordon playing charity fundraiser presenter of the, what's it called? The something of ISIS? And uh, obviously they're doing this to spring a trap against Mr. Freeze. And you can, yeah, that guy, that gorilla just yeeted that lady off the, nobody said anything either. She just kind of fell into the bottomless hole. Yeah. 
You know, I see this guy all the time, and I think he's... Is it him or the other guy? Senator Leahy or... I forget his name. There's like a politician that loves Batman that puts himself in almost every movie he can. Yeah, we have the gorilla doing a very sensual dance here. Obviously, that's going to be Poison Ivy. And again, Uma Thurman knew her assignment well in this movie. She did not stray from the type of Poison Ivy that she wanted to bring on screen. And this look right here. You know, aside for, from the, the, the brow frills, whatever you'd call that, I mean, those are fine. Um, see, hairstyle, hair down, I mean, costume-wise, very comic book-ish. Very in line with the Poison Ivy that I think of when I think of Poison Ivy. And probably her best look in this entire movie. When she brings out the conical hairstyle, that's when it's like, oh boy. It's really silly to look at, but yeah. Great introduction scene to her. You know, obviously Robin Smitten. He's already decided that crime fighting is out the window. He's all about poison ivy now. No idea who she is. And, of course, Schumacher just very in tune with accentuating sensuality in this movie. Um, a lot of people say that he went above and beyond with some of that stuff. Uh, again, depending on who you speak to, that could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. Uh, just kind of whatever for me anyway. Poison Ivy. Somebody said, well, I saw another, uh, I'd been, I watched a, uh, like a review of this film maybe a few weeks ago. Uh, somebody had no mentioned that the dark eye makeup that Batman traditionally wears to kind of make sure that he doesn't have that mask look. Like when you put on a really bad mask from Spirit Halloween and your eyes are like <laughs> you're cross-eyed. <laughs> or you're, you know, it's like it's so ill-fitting that you see like all the skin and the, the texture of your skin underneath. and um, The black eye makeup is supposed to make the face kind of, you know, not blend, but look good with wearing a cowl right and some people were criticizing this and saying that the black eye makeup in daylight or in a well-lit scene just looks bad or stupid and i honestly i don't i don't see it i mean it's it's like they say that it make they, they just makes them look like raccoons because in batman 1989's batman and here they're and then infamous uh Batman credit card, and funny enough, it says F Batman Forever on it, too. But yeah, I never had a problem with the eye makeup. Just something that, just nitpicky stuff, I think. See, these people here, Mr. Freeze is f essentially freezing them to death, so p he's killing people right here, because they don't go back and thaw them out. So, I mean, the body at that temperature goes into hypothermic shock really fast, and I'm pretty sure they're dead. He's killed these people. So Mr. Freeze isn't, that, isn't as forgivable as we like to think he is by the end of the movie. From what I... From watching Schumacher's uh, commentary on this particular scene... He said that he was going for uh, 70s 
something like these. He said it's very specific. There's some phraseology he used for this scene here that it was supposed to mirror something. And off the top of my head, I can't remember. But it was something about like cereals, like it was uh, Saturday night cereals or something like that. Maybe I'm, I'm confusing this with another scene. See right there, like one or two puns, okay, it'll be fine. It's keeping in line with the goofy kind of Mr. Freeze that we're getting. Every other sentence, every other sentence, clever little clover, really. It's pretty much everything. It's every single pun. Every single pun. It's a cool party. He departs, takes a necklace. The vehicle, I will say, I think I had this one when i was a kid just I, I i didn't have any batman and robin figures and i didn't have like any other merch aside from there were these collectible cups from taco bell i don't know if you guys remember this that you got where you could collect these character cups with all the like four characters batman robin poison ivy mr freeze Sorry, Alfred, you didn't get one. <laughs> um, <laughs> or, oh no, they did, I think they did have Batgirl too, so there were five. Um, and you got them at Taco Bell for a limited time. So I think I had one or two of those, and I did have these the Mr. Freeze like ice vehicle. Um, maybe I had like one of the small like six or seven inch Batman and Robin figures that my grandma might have picked up at like a garage sale or something. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, but I wish I still had those collector's cups. You, you can actually find them on eBay for like $7, maybe $14 at the highest plus shipping. I'm always hesitant in getting some of these collector's cups because I think that plastic biodegrades a certain way and you don't want to use it for too long, like drink out of it, I think. I don't know. So if you're you're getting one, I don't think it's advisable to drink from it because it's like been what over 25 years. But I have one from Taco Bell or Pizza Hut. I think it's Taco Bell uh, during the release of Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. I think I, I have the Sebulba collector's cup with the topper, so I don't drink out of it. Maybe down the line I might showcase some of these because over the years, past maybe three years or so, I've gotten some pretty cool additions to some of my collector's stuff that I've picked up over over like two or three years. So it's uh, it'll be nice to show you guys some of that stuff maybe down the road sometime. I'm honestly busier than usual, a lot, lot more to do than uh, usual right now, so... Maybe when I find time to do that. Down the road, down the road, down the yellow brick road. God, my computer almost yeeted off the desk there. And I gotta stop using the word yeeted. I sound unironically horrible when I say that. And this scene here, I, I wish that uh, we'd actually seen a fight between Batman and Mr. Freeze because he glides into the vehicle, like clearly knocks him out. And then Mr. Freeze looks like he's paralyzed on the floor there. And you saw his expression. He looked like he's like had a stroke or, so <laughs> or something. And uh, Batman is just kind of heroing it up. I'm here
Yes, bobblehead Batman. Yes. I will say that this Batman does have one of the better cowls. Uh, I actually like, even though I, well, obviously I love the Dark Knight trilogy. This is not in the same league as those movies. But one of my biggest gripes with those films, even one of the few, very few gripes I have, is that Batman's cowl looked off in The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises. And I say off, it's like it doesn't it doesn't look like a costume. It just it looks too tactical. Like the cowl here looks gr looks great. I mean, I, there's one thing these movies do is that they do get the cowls right. Um, so Batman looks good. Like the the streamlined costume here looks good. Obviously, the bat nipples were a choice. Um, Schum Schumacher said that the he was going for like a Roman armor look. Where it's like it's like it, it it emphasizes the. I said it sounds horrible when I <laughs> say it, but the male anatomy, like the chest plate or anything, um. I mean, but overall, looks fine. And again, here we have another moment between Bruce Wayne and Alfred. Again, he's he's thinking of Alfred, as being mortal for the first time. Uh, we've never gotten this in a Batman movie up until this point. He's always just been a supporting character through Batman's work. It's never been an exploration of their relationship as, you know, Bruce Wayne as a as an adult dealing with who he looked at as like a father figure being sick, you know. And I'm trying to remember, does he know he's sick by this point? I think he does. Or he might not, yeah. I'm trying to think. Nope, I don't, yeah, well. Don't worry, I'm not going to go back, I'm not going to. Say, all right, guys, pause. We're gonna we're gonna go back together and figure out if Alfred had let that detail slip through swing yet. You know, Alicia Silverstone got a lot of flack for this. Um, she was off the successes of movies like Clueless and uh, what, what was that movie? Um. There's another one she was really well known for at this time, but she was like peak popularity after this movie. It's like her career just took a nosedive. Um, she was active, but she was she would never reach like the cinematic presence that she had during this era. And I think that's not fair um, because nobody was really impacted by this movie. Like people try to say that they were. Sch Schwarzenegger was it. Clooney wasn't. Even O'Donnell wasn't. Uh, Uma Thurman definitely wasn't. I mean, maybe for, I mean, because some people were like, oh, well, Clooney couldn't bounce back. I mean, he literally had like back to back successes after this movie. If anything, this movie was like a death knell for the Batman franchise. For the people involved in it, aside from Silverstone, very minimal career damage. And I can back that up with like several projects under Clooney's belt. O'Donnell was very present in television. And so was, um, I, okay, maybe Pat Hingle. <laughs> I mean, that's the, the only person. I mean, Pat Hingle was never like a bona fide household name anyway. So I'll give you that, Pat fucking Hingle. There you go. And Alicia Silverstone. But everyone else was fine. But the franchise was not. We wouldn't get another Batman film for at least eight years. Yeah, because I think Batman Begins came out in 2005. What I what I don't get is that they they made this poor man. I mean, Mr. Freeze obviously has it. This is a disability. Um, he'll die if he's not in below freezing temperature. And these guys at Arkham, this is supposed to be a place for the criminally insane. So people here are obviously out of their mind. Mr. Freeze, 
probably is the more well-rounded when it comes to his mental faculties among some of the other well-known uh, residents of Arkham Asylum. You know, the Joker, the Riddler, uh, Scarecrow, some of these people that have, you know, embraced their persona with a lot of mental health issues, <laughs> apparent. Um, Mr. Freeze is probably one of the least insane people, and they've he has a he has a certifiable disability. If this man is not in the cold, he will die. I mean, even the toilet, I mean, is that a toilet or just a sink? I mean, what is he supposed to do? He's going to risk taking a poop or dying, right? He's going to risk taking a poop and dying or just holding it in and having worse issues there. Uh, not fun. I, this part, I, I really like this. Again, we're, we feel like we're present. We're fear, we feel like, okay, so maybe I was wrong. That isn't The conical look for Poison Ivy hasn't come yet. She still has the uh, the look that we had from that ball, uh, the charity ball. But here, you feel very, it's a very lived-in set. Like, the set design is nice. See, goofy sound effects. Was it necessary? No. Could have done the same thing, came across the same way. But notice the set design. Neon. Very vibrant. Very just, you look, it looks like it's straight out of a comic book. The positioning of the furniture, very, just everything, and it's it's nice. We don't we don't get that nowadays, with superhero movies. Everything's just grayscale and uniform and and shiny, just shiny, shiny everything. Like everything's so shiny, the suits are shiny, the sets are shiny. Everything's fucking shiny. I'm gonna stop saying shiny because I sound annoying. Probably saying that. I will say here is where, again, CGI doesn't quite hold up. Uh, stare at too long and it looks out of place. Some of it works, but the closer you get to like these vines extending out of the ground and kind of branching across the room here, they just they look like they're not there. Yeah, like I see that orange flower there in the right corner, the way that kind of its petals kind of extended. Yeah, this it looks bad. It's it's dated, but hey, you know what are you gonna do? Nineteen ninety seven. This one right here, this little one that goes to, yeah, you can t looks like a Windows Microsoft ninety five graphic there. And this character here is supposed to be Bruce Wayne's kind of fiance. And I forget this actress's name. What is Elle McPherson, right? Elle McPherson. Um, and I'm trying to think. W there was something well known that she was uh, she was in. Elle McPherson. And what other movie? It's like I always recognize her from this movie and one other movie. Uh, was it something in television? No, I think it's I think it's from the movie Sirens. She played a character called Sheila. So it's, I always, whenever I think of Elle McPherson, I think of Sheila and. Julie Madison, that's her name in this. Oh my god, every time I see this movie, I forget her name. Yeah. There's actually something in the original screenplay or script where Mr. Freeze murders her. Or, no, no, I'm sorry, Poison Ivy kills her. And schumacher decided not to use that because it would make the ending of this movie make no sense whatsoever so he scrapped it because he felt like it would make mr freeze irredeemable by the end of the film but i feel like again there's nuggets of the darker nature found in the original screenplay for this movie but they decided schumacher decided nope camp all the way that's what we're going for. 
this scene right here where Robin is tailing Barbara to the illegal street race, probably one of my favorite moments in the movie because it felt it felt very high octane. It felt it, it felt like it's also a much better representation. See right here, it's like this is this. Th you know what these are, right? Th th those were just studio plugs. The a Clockwork Orange. Um, were they wearing wigs representing Amadeus? I don't know, but th I I know that those were like WB Studios like callbacks there. And of course, we have Coolio here playing uh, a very uh, replaceable cameo. Anybody could play this role, but hey, Coolio was popular this time too. Put him in the movie. We have Ponytail Biker Dude saying that he's going to beat Barbara and betting on it. We have the Lo Lost Boys meets Mad Max children and people cheering them on. Spike. You know, um, again, we see more of the set design here. Again, this is where Schumacher excels. You feel like it's like this. This is like a, a weird lived in city. You know, you have the graffiti. You have the the weird architecture. You have the, the grungy neon lit alleyways and uh, buildings that look just like neglected and dilapidated for me this felt very like late 80s action octane you know just something you'd see out of a late 80s action flick the one thing i always notice is that movies from this period they like to change the color of fire and i don't know if it was a like a pyrotechnic thing that the, the, the production teams did on purpose, or was this something supposed to be aesthetically different, but flames are always like blue or green. Yep, obligatory large truck that gets in the way in the race. <laughs> Yeah, funny enough, like they sabotage her motorcycle like Sebulba <laughs> sabotages Anakin's uh, in The Phantom Menace. So I was thinking of that when I saw this. Um, on this, obviously, now, but uh, yeah, it always remind me, reminds me of that. What I don't get is that the city, like Gotham City knows that they have this like super dangerous suspension bridge that isn't completed or is like non-accessible to the public in terms of a regular roadway. No, I wouldn't say non-accessible, still accessible, but it's, there's no use for it or they, they should block it. Like, look, look at this. This is insane. First of all, why in the world are they building a bridge that high up? Like, this is insane. That is a road bridge, like, f 100 stories up? Maybe more? That's crazy. So we're watching together here. We should all be at the one hour and six minute mark. So let's kind of comment on the runtime for this here. Two hours, about two hours with credits.
But it doesn't feel that way, though. Right? You watch this, and it's kind of like, bam, 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 bam. Next scene, next scene, next scene, next scene, next scene. The, uh, it doesn't feel like it drags on. Like, honestly, and again, I have no problem with it. I like Batman Forever, but guys, I will tell you, there are moments in Batman Forever where I feel it drags on. Like, drags on. And I don't blame the actors. I don't blame... Um, I don't... I don't even blame Schumacher. I think it's got to be maybe the screen script rewrites or, or maybe the pacing that they, they start. I mean, the, I don't I don't know what it is, but it's just it feels like it drags on. Like there are moments in that movie where I'm like, OK, what are we waiting for now? Like, I think it all revolves around Robin, though. I don't know why. It's like Robin in that movie. It's like it's weird. They haven't found like here. He's like he's he's there. He's present. He's doing things constantly. There it was like he was. I don't know. And again, that's not Chris O'Donnell's fault. He's just doing what they're telling him to do. They, I think, I think they were just trying to find their 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 footing with what kind of Robin they wanted. It's almost. It makes us ponder how would Batman have fared if they had gone with Burden's initial desire to have Marlon Wayans play Robin in the third Batman installment, have Harvey Dent stay in his role as uh, Harvey Dent. I'm sorry, um, <laughs> Harvey Dent staying in his role. Billy D. Williams staying in his role as Harvey Dent Two-Face. That was actually going to be a thing, guys. Robin was going to be in the third one as... I mean, Marlon Wayans was going to be Robin in the third one. See, and there we go. That weird, conical... boob hair. <laughs> it's like boob hair. But, you know, we're looking at like 1970s bra boob hair. And again, at this time, Arnold is a bigger dude. So they purposely put him in this oversized prisoner's outfit where it looks like he could fill it out more because he's supposed to be like a nerdy. I mean, he's supposed to be smart. I mean, I think Bruce Wayne was mentioning that he was a varsity athlete or something, but this is a bodybuilder. I mean, he has a bobby bodybuilder's body. I mean... So, I don't know why. They should have just stuck with, hey, he's a big dude. That's who he is, this version, anyway. Then we look at... Yep, see, two more deaths. Poison Ivy kills two more people. Bane breaks into the evidence locker, getting Mr. Freeze's equipment and suit. And I thought this was so... Fucking hilarious. Bane is going through the asylum with a cart full of Mr. Freeze's stuff. It looks like he's like shopping. Like this is like Black Friday shopping right here. And and I'm sorry for all you folks that go out on Black Friday, but this is what you look like. That's what you look like. You look like Bane pushing Mr. Freeze's uh junk in a shopping cart through the store. You're gr you're probably growling and grunting as you're doing that. I know it. I can bet money that you're doing that. And you're angry. So you're probably l this you're probably So Bane is actually more patient than you. Just think about that for a moment. Live with yourself. This Thanksgiving, be thankful. Don't go out to Walmart. Don't go out to fucking wherever. D don't go and buy into the commercial bullshit. Go enjoy Thanksgiving with your family. Don't eat turkey and then run out with half-digested mashed potatoes and cranberries in your gut to go buy some overpriced television. That's my little holiday PSA. Enjoy Thanksgiving. Don't shop. Now, I looked into this, and I, and I try to find anything on... Because while water... Well, freezing water in pipes does cause damage to the pipe itself. That's why they always say when we have a frost warning, 
or a cold front moving in, cover your pipes if they're exposed outside with something, uh, with some kind of insulation. Well, not so much insulation, but something that'll cover the exterior of the pipe so that it doesn't crack when it gets too cold. Um, I don't know if you can quite do this where you can freeze the pipe completely and it'll create a fissure in the structure itself. For those of you who are mechanical engineers, I, I guess you'd say, or people who have knowledge of this kind of stuff, let me know. Is this possible? It's cartoonish. But is it? Can it be done? I don't think so. But Also, Arkham Asylum is insane for putting people at the highest room in the tallest tower like this, something out of Shrek or Rapunzel, um, and expecting that maybe they won't try to commit suicide um <laughs> jumping out of a, when they get it i mean that's that's insane or just somebody accidentally falling to their death i mean it's like there's no way either of them survive uh, e none of them i mean among the three maybe B maybe bane but you're hitting water from that height you ain't getting up jack sorry to break it to you And this right here, very nice moment between Bruce Wayne and Alfred, you know? <laughs> you kind of notice that George Clooney stopped running as he went around the corner. It's like, our Schumacher's like, right now, run to the Batcave. He runs, he just stops like a few steps past that stairwell. I thought this was so ridiculous. You see Bane wearing like an inspector gadget type outfit in disguise and he's still wearing the mask. Because he doesn't, I don't know if he has to wear the mask because I don't know if the apparatus that he wears, if, that, if the tubing for the venom goes directly into his head or, or if the mask is like sealed onto his head or something, but... It's got to go into his cranium somehow. So I'm thinking to myself, how, how is Bane wearing or getting venom fed into his body? So does he have to wear the mask? I don't know. Just ridiculous. Imagine going around at the airport and seeing some big dude dressed up like that. It's pretty obvious he's insane or up to something. This lady that plays Nora Freeze here. I believe that she was dating George Clooney at the time. So even up close, Mr. Freeze's suit has a lot of detail. It's really well made. But man, man that's got to be tough to walk around in. Arnold, what are you doing in here? This is my house, damn it. You know, you would you would think that Commissioner Gordon, the GCPD, would maybe keep an eye on that lever there to make sure they don't fucking freeze to death. Maybe, I don't know, put a fucking lock or something on that. Or I mean, you can control the temperature of the room that drastically. Maybe this place is insane. <laughs> This shouldn't have been an ice cream shop to begin with. It's like a torture chamber for people. S super good for refrigeration, though. Got to give it that. Whoever, whoever, sell sold that system to that place, they should get an, like a triple, triple A rating. And again, Bane is fighting Batman on a catwalk. What does that remind you of? 
I'm not going to say it so that you're thinking of it. Batman conveniently lands on a bag of... What are those bags? Is this something snow cones on? But those aren't snow cones. They look like bags of sand. Or pillows. They're like pillows. They are literally pillows. Why do they have pillows with snowy cones logos on them? What's the purpose of that? Schumacher's like, all right, we need we need George Clooney to fall over the railing onto something. How do we make sure he doesn't get hurt, but then try to keep with the aesthetic of the environment? Okay, go out, get me a bunch of burlap sacks, stamp a snowy cones logo on it, and God willing, the freaking audience won't tell the difference between a bag of literal sand pillows versus actual ice cream backstock. So right here, Commissioner Gordon is the hero. So I'm sorry, he does do something. I'm sorry, Pat Engel, you did do something. You did, you did, you did one thing worthy of note in this movie. There you go. Cold to heat. And again, see, that's that campy, that's that campy environmental stuff. Like in the in the 1960s Batman show, it was like to disarm bomb, to not disarm bomb. Like it was a so like cartoonishly obvious like what to do like press button A save the people press button B blow the people up it was like I will say um, Batman beats the holy hell out of Bane in this like Bane was, looks so fucking bad compared to Batman here like Batman Bane has the upper hand for a moment but look what Batman just he fucking beats him up hits him right in the head with tubing being false <laughs> being false What kind of ice cream do you think that is, guys? I think I thought it was mint, like mint chip, but then you don't see any little specks of black, so it's not mint chip. I think it's pistachio ice cream. Wait, wait, is that? No, it's pistachio. And this is where Poison Ivy disconnects, disconnects Nora. So she kills Nora, well, she presumably kills Nora Freeze at this moment because she doesn't want to compete with her. So foul. And we get more of that uh, set dichotomy that we saw in Batman Forever, where uh, Two Face separated his lair, dark and light. But this is going to be uh, jungle versus frozen wonderland. See, so could have. Uh, could have been a nice moment of grief. Schumacher just had to add the extra sauce, you know? Mr. Freeze is being torn up about the death of his wife and Batman presumably killing her. Would have been enough. Would have been enough. I mean, even the monologue would have been fine, you know? 
the uh, icicle teardrop a little too much. Yep. Revenge. Endless winter. The world. Um, so if everything is dead on Earth, let's say you're... Okay, this is the... This is essentially the Ice Age, right? What does that mean for the flora and fauna? I, I, Poison Ivy is supposed to be a champion of the environment, right? So you're going to kill so many ecosystems by freezing them. Uh, so she's developed these plants to survive in ice, in tundras, I guess, a tundra environment. So I'm overthinking it. That little puppet uh, Venus flytrap snake thing is, is, is goofy, but it's pretty neat that you get a little goofy thing like that. But would that work? I mean, there are places in the world where plant life can exist in like sub-freezing temperatures, below freezing temperatures, but overall, uh, an ice age doesn't bear too well for most of the tropics, <laughs> most of the uh, places south of the equator. I don't know. Okay, so this is where Barbara and Dick, uh, it's the first time I'm calling him Dick in this, <laughs> Dick Grayson, they figure out that uh, poor Alfred has stage one of McGregor syndrome. And McGreg McGregor's apparently knocks you on your ass pretty quickly because in the scene before Alfred was walking around, moving around, now the poor man's bedridden, looking like he's on his last throws. And here's more, more of that back and forth between Bruce and Dick where and I'm trying to think do we don't get this in another Batman movie I mean even the Dark Knight trilogy we get again it's more conflict between Bruce and Gordon, Bruce, and Rachel. Uh, obviously, Robin is in The Dark Knight Rises, but it's not like he gets brought under Bruce Wayne's wing to become Batman. He become, He's not even Robin in that movie. He's John Blake, and no one just tosses him. Oh, yeah, he has... I mean, it's just such a... He's a good character, don't get me wrong. Just a cheap insert when it comes to him being Robin, because he's not... He does no Robin things in this... I mean, he's just a sidekick cop. Uh, but he's a fine character for that movie. Just I don't ever see him as Robin throughout that entire film. It's just, he's just there as the guy helping Bruce and Commissioner Gordon. Or Batman, better put. Batman for Bruce, not Batman for <laughs> Commissioner Gordon. <laughs> Commissioner Gordon is like the VIP of that movie, though, man. that he's, He gets put through the ringer. So let me get this straight. Alfred wants Barbara to take that to Wilfred, but he can't even get a hold of Wilfred. So how is Barbara going to get a hold of Wilfred? Isn't he in like trekking in the jungles of India or Bangladesh or wherever the hell he's at? And there's Gossip Gertie at the unveiling of the new telescope at the Gotham Observatory. Again, practical set. They built this thing. I remember seeing the behind-the-scenes featurette for this particular scene in the movie. They, I mean, this thing is to scale. This isn't a miniature. This isn't something that they built, uh, like, with a super, like, not superimposed, but they manipulated the background to make it look larger than it actually is. This is actually something built in to scale. Obviously not the part jutting out of the facade of the observatory or whatever you call it, but... The, the interior right here, that is legit. 
there. So that's pretty cool. Again, we don't get a lot of that now, and it's, it's a shame. We get some of it, but not like it was during this time and before. Like big sets, loud sets, a lot of color, a lot of noise. Like you feel like you're there. And this is the last time we're going to see Commissioner Gordon. And in the last prominent action this character takes, the most significant action he takes, he hands the keys to Poison Ivy, to Pamela Isley here. And uh, that's it. We don't see Commissioner Gordon anymore. That was that was his run, guys. Say goodbye to Pat Hingle. Goodbye, Pat Hingle. Thank you for all you've done <laughs> for the Batman franchise up until this point. We will never be seeing you again in a Batman movie. And we end with poor Pat Hingle with a goofy look on his face. Ah. You know, and she's asking Bruce, you know, show me how the these satellite works. Does Bruce actually know how it works? Or is he just going to sh bring her to the demonstration around the satellite? Because uh, it's, like, it's like they have to use a keyboard, right, to, use, to initiate the sequences and stuff. So he doesn't know how to use it. He just funded it. So apparently anybody can access the bat signal, guys. Anyone. You can just hop on up to the top of the GCPD building. You know, cause untold damage to police property. And I think it's police property. This is and nobody will come up and check on you. You know, Gotham PD is this can't be bothered about possible vandalism or property damage to their literal headquarters. So yep, yep it's all right. You can literally destroy and reinstall another signal. This scene here, where Barbara is trying to access Alfred's CD, um, she put some of the most bogus passwords in. It's <laughs> crazy. This is a sad scene. Oh, poor Alfred. Even on his deathbed, he's proselytizing. You know, it's it's again these moments between Bruce Wayne and Alfred that uh, that show the merits of Schumacher's uh, directorial ability, right? I mean, he can he can put some pretty significant dramatic acting in his movies, you, no matter how campy and goofy they can be. And that's a credit to both. George Clooney and Michael Goff here. Shouldn't use the word proselytize. Maybe it's just words of wisdom. Because I don't think Alfred, I was like, why did I use the word proselytize? It was more like he's sharing some words. Yeah, Bruce, don't worry. Keep fighting for what you believe in. There's no victory in death. Margaret. Uh, 
This always got me. Alfred literally leaves a clue on his desk to access the most secure, I would say confidential information for Bruce Wayne, his entire estate, in its peg. Three, three letters, one word, no numericals, no special characters, nothing. Imagine, imagine some, some, if they had hired like a, a nosy housekeeper for a day filling in for some event and she just like happened to come into the into the office there and just mess around with the laptop and just put peg for fun she'd literally know bruce wayne is batman like alfred should not be tra if if alfred ran like password algorithms everybody would be hacked everybody he's like he comes up with the most ridiculous <laughs> easy passwords to to ha you know i I have no words for it. When I saw that, I'm like, really, Peg? Might as well just fucking put dog. And here's more of that back and forth, you know, brotherly. Let's do this together. And it's, it's a good moment, right? I mean, you're not a... Uh, it's that conflict between them, talking about trust, talking about uh, And uh, these two are both well-known character actors. Off the top of my head, I know I've seen them in so many different things, but I never remember their names. Is the body over? I'm the body pooper. Wrong movie. See, right there, he gets frozen. She gets frozen. By the time Batman shows up, I'm pretty sure they should have died. Pretty sure. I love how Mr. Freeze conveniently has icicle-shaped bombs. <laughs> Hell freezes is over. Again, very comic book super villain, but not what Mr. Freeze typically does, right? Or how he acts anyway. That's like that's like I wouldn't say only comic book, but that's like I would say like not even Connery. That's like Roger Moore era James Bond villain. Maybe even Bros. No, not Brosnan. I mean, the the wackier James Bond villains were like from Connery and Moore's generation of films. So eras, excuse me, a film. But very, very camp, very camp. So again, your your mind is gravitating towards those nineteen sixties uh, to the nineteen sixties Batman show. So let me get this straight: um, uh, <laughs> digitized Alfred here, uh, Max Headroom Alfred. <laughs> he foresaw that Barbara was going to find a way into the Batcave, and we get. Of course, we need to see Alicia Silverstone in her bat suit. So we're going to get. Shot of her suiting up. Um, anyway, uh, 
we he he foresaw that his niece was going to somehow find her way into the bat cave so he went out of his way to mind you uh get her proper measurements to make a suit for her as well so um what can alfred do ladies and gentlemen alfred is he is the goat i don't give i don't give a shit what you guys do for your respective uh incomes right i don't care what you're doing i don't care if you're out there curing uh the most destructive diseases known to mankind i don't care if you're fighting a one-man war in east asia i don't care if you're uh juggling 17 different professions because you can't afford rent in the san francisco bay area <laughs> you are you will never you will never ever ever be as accomplished and as well-rounded as alfred is this is a 60 something 70 something 80 something year old man who can absolutely do everything all at once all the time and he's also a fucking fortune teller so I don't care what you think. I don't care how accomplished you think you are. I don't care how many degrees you think you uh, that I don't care how many degrees you have that gives you the belief that you're going to be the most successful and well-rounded working person on this planet. You have nothing, nothing on Alfred. Alfred is a fucking legend. He can make a bat. He can make a bat suit for you. In 20 years from now with the measurements that you'll have 20 years from now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> God. When I saw that, I'm like, even as a kid, I'm like, wait a second. Wait a fucking second. How does Alfred know her his her measurements? Did he buy a bat suit for her sometime when she was a, like a te like a late in her late teens, early 20s? Like, when did he go out and measure, get measurements for Barbara? When the fuck did he do that? I'll give him a pass on Bruce and Dick Grayson, Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson, but come on. That's like, you just can't even think, you can't even, don't even think about it, because the more you think about it, it's just so fucking stupid. But hey, Alfred can do it all. Schumacher says, hey, Alfred's, Alfred's, he, Alfred can literally be Batman. I'm, that's it. Alfred can be Batman. He says, he just chooses not to, because he's just too good. He's giving, he's letting Bruce do something. Now this scene here, I appreciated that Poison Ivy's using her environment, right? This reminded me of the Arkham games too. You face Poison Ivy in both Arkham Asylum and Arkham City. No, no, Arkham Asylum and wait, I think you, I think you face her in all the games except for Arkham Origins, if my memory serves me correctly. I think Arkham Knight she becomes more of an antihero in that one. But this, this fight, I mean, it's all right, I guess. I mean, we had, we were going to have Batgirl and Poison Ivy face off eventually, but, um, fun fact right there, that, that, they did not film him coming out of the water. That's in reverse, by the way, you can tell. <laughs> it's so stupid. Um. fight's okay you know there's some banter back and forth i mean obviously we we're never going to see batman and robin you know exchange fisticuffs with poison ivy so at least bad girl does have a purpose here where she yeah she's going to be the one to take down poison ivy um short all right fight you know except for this right here what really that it's your it's your plant chair why would your own plant chair eat you was it pissed off that you landed on it wrong or don't again weird i mean i guess they had to somehow subdue her without subduing her completely i don't know could have just tied her up See, Batman was ahead of the curve for you Gen Zers out there shitting on films from the past, being not socially aware and uh, politically correct or, you know, conscious of triggering vocabulary. See, bad person, right? 
it's a joke. So, you know, if you get offended by it, don't know what to tell you. I love how Mr. Freeze is shooting his ice gun or whatever it is at the city and he's supposed to be panning the ray or the direction of the 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 ice ray side to side but he was literally moving <laughs> he was literally moving the joystick thing like up and down like and he was moving it like the way your 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 grandfather would if you were teaching him how to play video games like he's just jerking <laughs> he's jerking the he's jerking his joystick he's jerking his joystick up and down really quickly oh my god I love how precise this gun is too. Like he has a little magnifying thing on there. He can he can zoom in like a scope on whatever he wants to shoot at. Like this is this is top tier technology right here. And this is where you really understand that Schumacher was looking to sell a bunch load of crap based off this movie, right? And I say crap, I'm not meaning like crap, like it's worthless. What, like the, obviously this is gonna be sold to children, right? Action figures, like all this stuff. I, I, I remember seeing the little jet ski thing. I remember seeing the bat cycle for Batgirl. Um, that boat thing that, uh, robin is driving uh i remember nobody wanting that one like i saw like dozens of those hanging up at like toys r us and kb toys walmart not walmart target um nobody wanted that weird swamp vehicle <laughs> thing thing that you'd see on like uh what was that show on animal planet with uh those guys that eat hunt and eat and sell crocodiles or alligators uh swamp people yeah, nobody wanted that one. But l let's get this. Let's think about this for a second. They had enough time to go back to Wayne Manor, the Batcave, pick up ice themed vehicles and put on ice themed suits, right? To specifically face off against Mr. Freeze. Again, I'm going to bring up fucking Alfred again. How the hell does Alfred know to build or buy or help some, have someone engineer these things? And did he tailor these? So that means Alfred not only made one suit for Barbara. Oh, no. He knew. Alfred knew that in the future, his niece would somehow, I hope you're following me, would somehow have to face an ice-themed villain. And she would have to wear an outfit aesthetically comparable to the villain. So he made two suits for Barbara. So, hey, that's Alfred being the GOAT. Greatest of all time. So if, Hey, if you ever need a, anything done in your life, just call Alfred. He does everything. Plumbing. Cooking. Uh, you need a greenhouse built. He can do that. You need a, like cure uh, a new mutant version of measles he can do that too he can do anything guys alfred is like the greatest individual who's ever graced this universe we all want to be alfred let's just admit it he's he's the real mvp and this is where uh Robin and Batgirl, they, everyone kind of splits up, does their own little thing here, you know. We get, we get a little bit of the, the, you know, everyone calls Batman the world's greatest detective. We get a little bit of him trying to figure some things out technically here, you know. How are we going to stop this, this satellite-driven ice telescope thing? Now, I never understood. Does Mr. Freeze have some kind of, like, light emanating out of his mouth or is that from the suit reflecting back into his mouth so it looks like he's is he wearing like like battery operated light invisalign or something like 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 it's like colorful invisalign i don't know what's going on there
And uh, here's where we're about to get uh, Robin and Batgirl facing off against You see, a lot of people, sh they, they just crapped on Alicia Silverstone for s even other things that were really wrong. Like, they were, like, going on about her weight. Like, she couldn't, like, there was something about her not fitting in the suit. At some, some stupid crap. They were just going after her for some really stupid, trivial, like, honestly uh, sexist things during her involvement with this movie or around the time of the movie's release or something. But just so unwarranted, like... Okay, the movie isn't written the way you want it to. Yes, it's a campy, dorky, goofy version of Batman. Um, and yes, her Batgirl is unremarkable. But she's doing what she's supposed to doing. Do she's doing what she's doing? She's doing what she's supposed to do. It's her, you know she's doing as Schumacher wanted her to do in this movie. And it's like, yeah, it's just the material isn't there for her to be a an, an amazing Batgirl. I mean, hell, we just had a three season television show for Batgirl and that was fucking garbage I'd take this Batgirl over that Batgirl any day I mean this one isn't even Barbara Gordon that one's just like what the fuck was going on with that one? Oh no I'm sorry excuse me it wasn't Batgirl we just had a Batwoman show that CW uh, train wreck so even then I'd still take this camp version of Batgirl over that uh, serious uh, undertaking at giving us a TV version of Batwoman. And here we have Bane uh, shriveling down to nothing. So, as you can see, he's he's lost all his Venom-powered abilities there, so he just shrinks back to normal. Um, but the mask is still all gone, and it's loose, so I don't, I don't know if that... They never... I don't think they thought that through. Again, this is... Uh, I'm overthinking it. Oh, there you go. The heat is on. One liner. Mr. Freeze falls onto the uh, machine there. Damn, he he clocked him good. So, I'm appreciative that we did get that. I just wish that, um, you know, they used more of Arnold's physical presence to his advantage in this movie because he's a. I mean, we all know that. This uh, Batman with George Clooney's uh, physical capability is not going to be taking down a, uh, a Mr. Freeze body bodybuilder, Mr. Freeze. So, but they could have, you know, sprinkled in a few more physical encounters between the two, you know, rough and tumble stuff, fighting, right? But no. Now for this laser to be effective to unthaw everything, it ha would have to be a a really really high temperature so you're thinking that you know how careful are they that they're unthawing like they unthaw the little dog they unthaw the building I mean it's just different you have to gauge everything differently but whatever don't think about it guys just enjoy it just enjoy it and you'll have a fucking good time Some people say that they left Bane to die here. I, I I did see somebody comment that when I was just kind of going through certain scenes of this movie. I do believe that is the case. They left Bane. There is no way that Bane survived this shit. Because he's literally like on a ledge adjacent to the observatory. And look, look, look at this shit. There is no way none of that debris did not just crush Bane. Bane's lying there, incapacitated. There's no way. Look at that. They're directly below it. It 100%. Like something, for sure, when some of the stuff hit Bane on its way down. Unless he's the luckiest son of a bitch ever and none of it hit him. But at the very least, he's not walking up from all this shit. And, uh... You know, that's another thing about Batman movies. We love a good grapple hook shot. I don't care which one it is. Tim Burton's 1989 Batman. I don't care if it's Batman in Justice League. I don't care if it's uh, Nolan's Batman. A good grapple shot is peak 
Batman material. Not peak. It's, it's, it's hallmark Batman material. You have to show a good grappling shot. If you don't do it, you're not doing Batman well. Or even trying to do Batman. So we can appreciate that, you know. Right there, you see how they that weird editing jump cut to them landing on their feet. You can obviously tell that that's a little bit of CGI put in, but not terribly bad. You know, we've had a we have had worse moments in this movie up until this point anyway, so And this I did appreciate that Barbara is tech savvy, right? You know, a little bit of a nod to her time well, her, t her time would ugh, I'm tongue tied a little nod to her being Oracle in the future right like she is smart when it comes to I wanted to say computation uh, she's smart when it comes to technology she's she's got uh, she's got a computer uh, say computer graphics she has a uh, Computer mathematics? What would we call it? Computer engine. God damn it, she's fucking smart. This guy's stumbling out of the... Uh, that guy kind of looked like Commissioner Gordon. The Gary Oldman one, anyway. See, I don't... Uh, even with the time that it took... They did this really quickly, right? Um, I still think a lot of these people would be dead. There's no way. I'm happy that the dog survived, though. I think when I was a kid, I was the, I was most concerned about the dog. I said, oh, my God, there's a dog. Mr. Freeze froze that poor dog. What's going to happen to that dog? And I was instant. I was a instant wave of relief, relief washed over me. I'm like, oh, thank God the uh, bulldog survived. See, in this moment here would be pretty uh sentimental he shows freeze the uh conveniently placed up close video footage of ivy confessing that she unplugged nora batgirl wasn't recording mind you so unless those gangsters had set up cct footage surveillance in that nasty converted poison ivy uh villain hi hideout uh i don't know how they would have gotten that um, and it's obviously uh, something they filmed. They just took that scene and just plugged it in. It's a p. It's like a <laughs> PIP uh, editing thing there. Um, but this moment here between Batman and Mister Freeze, where he's telling him, like, "Hey." You know, do something good, you you know, and you'll able to say you'll be able to do what you were always set out to do. Right. You're a doctor. You can help people. You can help my, you know, somebody suffering from this disease that has been affecting your wife for so long. Do the right thing. And it's a great moment. Right. It's it's like a, it's th this is this reminds me of like uh, it reminds me of that episode in Batman the Animated Series, where Mr. Freeze, is, like, you, you look to his, the better angels of his character as a tragic, tormented villain, and he ends up, you know, Batman is able to connect with him. And, and then they throw this in. Like, was that necessary? Take two of these and call me in the morning. Like, did we have to get that? Did, I mean, Ar Arnold, you just could not help yourself. You just had, you, I need to do it. I'm telling you right now. I need to put one more pun in there. And I need to make sure that the audience knows I'm the pun master. Don't you get it? Don't you get it? You take two of these and call me in the morning. What's going on in here? Did you take the medicine or not? I'm doing a follow-up call from Freeze Medical. Yeah, yeah. Ha, ha, yeah, yeah. Okay, Alfred's fine. Good. Um, so, did Robin go home and or back to Wayne Manor and change into his regular Robin costume? Because that's not the ice Robin costume. That's not the, the, uh, the Frost version. 
so this right here, um, we see Pamela Heisley now, you know, she ain't got no Poison Ivy outfit on, you know where she's at, she's got those, uh, she's got that Arkham, that Arkham fit going on, so she's locked up. Not. So let me get this straight. Mr. Freeze is, is dangerous with that suit, right? He can, I mean, if he wanted to, he could sabotage. He can find a way to, I won't say escape, but he could uh, find a way to disarm or take out the guards coming into the cell back and forth or something. And he could get find a way out because that's his life source, right? His suit. He can go wherever he pleases because it keeps him in a decent temperature for him to survive um but they put him in that suit in her cell and they're sharing i mean this is a a co-ed cell now i mean as a kid seeing this i'm like oh great i i'm pretty sure this guy's gonna kill her um because there's no way he's just gonna be in there like making noise when she wants to sleep and hogging the sink or uh staring at her ominously all day to make her uncomfortable like he's literally gonna make her life a living hell so either he beats the shit out of her and kills her or um schumacher was setting up a co-ed villain sitcom in the near future that he hasn't decided on how to write out yet and we see alfred uh he's back to normal guys fuck the he's like he's he is John Cena, but the difference is you can see Alfred. He is the GOAT. He is back. He is the greatest of all time, and he does not have McGregor Syndrome beating him down for the one, two, three return. And as uh, as implied here, Barbara is going to be joining the Bat family. Barbara. You know, I've been calling her Barbara the whole time, and I haven't said, is it Barbara Pennyworth? Or is it Barbara um, something else? Bar See, they're going to be partners. Yeah, that's right. And then Alfred throws in his one-liner. We're going to need a bigger bat cave. Barbara Wilson? That was her name? Was it Wilson? Oh my God! You see, that's why I don't remember. Because I'm, I'm thinking, is it Barbara Pennyworth? Nope, it's Barbara Wilson. Because you never even hear who her father is. So, okay, so Barbara joins the Bad Family, and we have a very triumphant running past the Bat signal. Is it the Bat symbol? And they're running towards the camera, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is Bat 1997s. Remember, 1997s, Batman and Robin by Mr. Joel Schumacher. Rest in peace, Mr. Schumacher, by the way. Again, I don't believe he deserved all the unnecessary hate that he got for this film. He may have given you a Batman you didn't want, but God damn it, it was a Batman you deserved. As always, and we see the credits roll. Um, so I'll kind of, if you guys want to let your credits roll, that is completely fine with me. But I'm going to stop here, and that concludes our Batman and Robin commentary. So I hope that you've enjoyed me on this really enlightening revisit to Batman and Robin. Um, again, guilty pleasure of mine. I, uh, this isn't a typical review for this film, but I, I will say it's a... Um, it's... See, the things I don't even want to call this movie bad because I can I'm willing to go out on a limb and debate this movie with anyone who says that it's supposed to be something else when it isn't and it's supposed to be bad. I can agree with you that there are many bad things about this movie, many of them. But overall, it's supposed to be viewed as something differently than the other installments. So it's you're not supposed to watch this one like you're watching Batman 89, or you're, you're not supposed to watch this one like you're watching Returns. Um, this is Schumacher's campy version of Batman, pulling from Silver Age comic lore featuring Batman, and inspired, and inspired by and an homage to the 1960s Batman TV show with the intent 
of selling toys. So keeping all that in mind, was Schumacher successful in his vision? Fucking absolutely. This this movie will get an A based off of the off, off of that criterion. Is it a good uh, modern Batman film? Fuck no. Fuck no. You compare this movie to the Dark Knight trilogy. You compare this movie to how uh, Ben Affleck carried Bruce Wayne in um, uh, Batman and Robin or Justice League, the Snyder Cut. Um, you compare it to uh, P- Robert Pattinson in Matt Reeves' The Batman. Fuck no. This Batman and Robin shouldn't even come close to any of those. That is modern Batman. And those versions are going to curb stomp the shit out of this version however this is a fun watch this is a fun batman movie and it's fucking hilarious this is like you can put this movie on anytime and you will find yourself watching it through because you're fucking having a good time you're enjoying it so if i were to give this movie a review solid fucking three solid just for the entertainment value solid three i i don't care um if you hate bat nipples, I don't care if you hate Mr. Freeze's overuse of the puns. Um, I don't care if you hate George Clooney's bobblehead uh, demeanor. Uh, this fucking movie has a lot of things to like about it. Production design, uh, moments between Bruce Wayne and Alfred, uh, the nonstop uh, high octane pace of the movie. You, you're never bored watching this movie. You're never feeling like, oh, what the hell is going to happen next because I really don't want to know what happens next. You're always jumping from one thing to the other, and it has a nice flow to the the film itself. Um, Obviously, this was a death knell for the Batman franchise because people at that time were just, they were tired of the flashier, goofier Batman stuff because they were just, what, 30, not even 30 years removed from West, and this was the only superhero media coming out. At the time, yeah, we ha- you're going you're gonna to have Blade. Yeah, you're going to have the Crow um, in that mix. But the Marvel days are still on the horizon. Not a- they're not on the horizon. They're still in the, in, in the near future, but still the future. People were like, this is the only kind of superhero film we're getting, and we don't want this Batman, and this is why this movie suffered. In terms of Schumacher's vision, he executed what he wanted to do, and I feel like if you watch this movie with the lens that it's going to be like Burden's Batman, or it's going to be like Snyder's Batman, it's going to be like Reeves's Batman, then of course you're going to fucking hate it. That's like me watching um, fucking uh, Police Academy and thinking I'm going to get, uh, I don't know, uh, what's a fucking uh, police film fr- series bad boys no i don't know something like you know i'm, I'm gonna watch um it's it's within the same genre but it's taking a different approach um it's like the phantom remember that movie with um billy zane or it's like um uh i wouldn't even say it's it's not comedy is its own thing this is camp camp is kind of it's it's weird camp is is like an off i don't say an offshoot it's like a sub genre of comedy or it's a, st- a sub stuff it's weird camp is its own like good camp i think this is good camp i i put this on the same level as the adam west tv show but with a with a 90s twist with a 90s flavor and i think it and i think it's okay and yeah I, a lot of people are probably going to shit on me for a lot of people are going to say well you have your rose colored glasses and it's all nostalgia yeah quite a bit of I would say quite a bit. Some of it is nostalgia. I can agree. Like, there's certain scenes in this movie where I'm like, this is fucking garbage. Look at, you can clearly see that they're cutting corners. You can clearly see that they're overdoing some of the dialogue and the the writing isn't quite where it should be for a Batman film. Absolutely. I'm with you. I'm 100%. I'm with you on that. But when it comes to the camp aesthetic, the tone and the set design and um, certain, the way certain characters are in the movie, and what they're supposed to be doing, it's fine. And it's it's a fun Batman popcorn movie. It's a it's 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 a bat it's a it's Batman junk food. There you go. If you're gonna if you're gonna call this anything, it's Batman junk food. You know it's not good for you. But it's it's delicious. It's Batman it's Batman Taco Bell, it's Batman Burger King, it's Batman McDonald's. This is this is Batman fast food. Like you're not going getting filet mignon Batman. 
that's Matt Reeves the Batman. You're not getting um, lobster bisque at a nice seafood place. That's like the Dark Knight trilogy Batman. This is fast food Batman. It's quick. It's fun. It's easy. And uh, yeah, you're going to regret it. But hey, you only live once, guys. Enjoy it. With that being said, thank you so much for joining me here on Unhinged with Kiriakos Vilches. And I just take the time to, you know, give you guys a shout out, each and every one of you. Thank you so much for uh, always being here for me in whatever capacity you can be. Um, I'm sorry for this late upload. A lot has been going on. Um, just I'll leave it at that. Uh, uh, good and bad. So that's that's life. What are you going to do? Um, but thank you for always kind of tuning in whenever you can. Um, and, you know, if you, this is your first time listening to my podcast, uh, probably listen to on Spotify on, or iHeartRadio or some other platform, um, or I'm sorry, uh, wherever you get your podcast, uh, or on YouTube. Um, thank you so much. Like, I appreciate you. Thank you for, uh, spending your time with me and, and giving me the benefit of the doubt that I'm not totally out of my mind. And I, some of the stuff I am saying is entertaining or educational or, uh, in, informational that we're having a good time together so thank you and uh keep an eye out for my upcoming episode with mr sandeep c uh he's in the wilds of new york doing his thing uh, i'm probably asking him about some of the stuff he's been up to when he joins me for our alexander episode that'll be a lot of fun thank you so much as always much love much appreciate much appreciate I <laughs> what was I doing there outside like a motorcycle much appreciate much appreciation to all of you and uh, I'll see you guys next time